Well, Corey, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, it's a real thrill for me. Uh, it's especially uh, great to be following Mike Loheis. Uh, uh, back when I finished my PhD at Virginia Tech, uh, Mike hired me as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Guelph uh, for a year. Does everyone know what a postdoctoral fellow is? Yeah, that's a PhD that can't find a job, so they, you can get them, get them in to do a research project. You don't even actually have to pay them very much, Don. You just get them in there to do some work. So, All right. Uh, so, again, uh, when I left uh, uh, Guelph, I was a little disappointed. I took a job with Pfizer. I re I'm a dairy guy, as all of you know. Uh, but as I look back on it, uh, things turned out pretty good. I don't know if I would have done any different. So, Because I'm here today, right? So, some of you know my dad, Phil. Uh, at, at last December, at 97, almost 98 years of age, he decided, yes, probably he'd go into some assisted care. So uh, we're all happy about that. <laughs> and so we're helping him downsize a little bit and going through the things. And I found this certificate, and I said, man, i got to keep this. And so for our international uh, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, this is not uh, 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 in kilos, it's 13,389 pounds of milk uh, with a 3.9, 3.5 fat test. Again, I don't know why he kept this certificate. Uh, uh, I w perhaps he, he just brought me home from the hospital the month before. Uh, I, I'm the eighth kid. And yes, we are Catholic. And, and so, uh, but anyway, it's pretty cool from Iowa State. Uh, you, on the lower Right-hand corner there, you see a, a guy by the name of Tom Lyons signed that certificate. I don't know, some of you know, may know, he took a job just north of here, I think. I don't know if he kept up with you much, but he's an Iowa State grad as well. But uh, anyway, so, you know, I've been in partnership with uh, two classmates from Iowa State, uh, dairy science, uh, since uh, 1995, when I got some disposable income. And so we look back at what we've done, and we've more than doubled the milk production in our cows. And the crazy thing about it is we're running a 4% fat percent. You know, so the fat yield, which is really our focus today, is that's more than double. And the two-year-olds we're freshening now, I mean, they're some kind of good. So you have to wonder, can we do much better? Are we getting close to the end? Uh, about as good as we can do? Well, again, part of my job, the nice thing about working at Pfizer, I get to work on all different species, dogs, cats, chickens, pigs. And uh, so I'm going to show a, a poultry slide here. So this is published by a poultry breeding company. They have maintained a randomly bred line of control birds from 1957. And they kept those birds around, just randomly picked sire, uh, sires and dams so they could keep the inbreeding low. And in 1991, they ran an experiment to compare the growth rates of those birds and the feed efficiency of those birds versus the, the birds they are currently selling in their commercial operations. Again, so in 1957, they harvested birds at three months of age thereabouts. And this uh, last year I got to go to England, and I realized that the pigeons in England are bigger than our pigeons here. That's a big pigeon. A carcass that weighs 1,000 1, grams, that's 2.2 pounds. My son would come home from football practice, and that would be an appetizer, right? So 1991, we don't harvest birds at 84 days of age anymore. It's 56 is an older bird, bird to be harvested. And they increased the weight of those birds by 300%. So they weighed four times what they did in 1957. Wow. So if my partner and I were doing a good job, of course, we didn't start our partnership until 95. You know, we'd be at 52,000 pounds of milk. Ten years later, they put another 100% growth on these birds. Wow. 66,000 pounds of milk we should be at on average. Many of you know at Bread, uh, Costco uh, had to build a poultry plant in Nebraska because they were having such a hard time finding birds that consistently fit their five dollar, what do they call it, uh, five buck cluck or something like that, right? They had to build their own plant because these birds grow so fast you really got to manage them to keep them that small. So tremendous, tremendous growth. So maybe we got a little room to grow yet. Maybe we think we're up here and the ceiling is 
is way up there. So, as I travel the country, and I kind of, as I was putting this talk together, I kind of straddle the breeder group, and I straddle the, the commercial dairy herd group. And, and one of the things I really hear from breeders a lot is, yeah, look what those poultry guys are doing. They focused on high heritable traits. That's how you make progress, man. What part of, didn't you go to school? If you make genetic improvement, you work on things that are heritable. What's wrong with you? So why are we selected, wasting our time on these lowly heritable traits? And again, this is the graph that I've updated. It shows our genetic improvement, uh, uh, you know, tremendous genetic improvement for milk production. Again, so we look back at what we've done since 1957. Uh, my, my partner and I, well, about half the genetic improvement we made was from gen eggs, and about half of it was increased nutrition, cow comfort, all the calf health things we've done. About half of it is due to, to that sort of things, and half due to genetics. But you can see the DPR. Uh, again, these are res uh, reported in breeding values. You'll notice on both the milk axis and the, uh, and the uh, DPR uh, value that these are reporting in breeding values, because there's our best predictor of performance. And so you can see in 1957, uh, those cows were minus 7,500 pounds of milk. That's their breeding value, half the, their transmitting ability be half that. And, then, and for DPR, they were 15. Wow, you know, that's, again, the definition of that is if my preg rate in my herd is 30, pretty good herd, those heifers would get pregnant 45% of the time in that herd, okay? Wow, that's, that's a big difference. Again, we've turned the corner, we kind of come around. Uh, again, the milk looks like it's really jumping up, but really, uh, we shouldn't look at milk anymore, because I'm not selecting for milk, I'm selecting for fat and protein. And you look at those two graphs, and you can see they are really jumping up, more so than milk. The index works, we're not, we are trying to make these uh, you know, Holsteins a high component breed. All right, again, so I'm not uh, as academic as Dr. Loheis, I need pictures, plus I'm from Iowa. We're not a very imaginative people. So this is Meyer's mistress, mistress Dark Anna. She was a good Iowa cow. She was champion at the 1957 National Cattle Congress. For those of you old enough to remember, that used to be the big show until those badgers took that away from us and started that World Dairy Expo thing in Madison. So uh, for $2, I could, I could find her at CDCB, sorry John, but I could go to uh, Holstein USA and spend $2 of my hard earned income and boom, it comes up with her fact sheet just like that. And, and today she is minus 39.89 for milk. Again, you saw the previous graph, her breeding value would be double that, or more, minus 8,000. So she was a breed average cow for her time, and she would be plus 8.4 for DPR. What's the first thing that jumps out at you as you look at her? <laughs> Don says short. Uh, I say she's got some condition on her. Uh, somebody said something about using beef semen. I think she'd make a pretty good beef calf. I don't know about you guys, but that, you know, you can't see those ribs too well. Uh, and, and, you know, she, again, I, I don't know if uh, Cy is here, if he would score her. I don't know if he would make her 92 today. But, uh, yeah, so different kind of cow. And, again, here's another good Iowa cow. We're looking at here, Bar uh, Gold Barbara, uh, 252 pounds of milk. Again, this cow was 10 years old. That's a pretty respectable number there. And she was about breed average for DPR, minus 2.8. Uh, Again, previous cow was 8.4 for DPR. This cow was minus 2.8. That's 10 points difference. That's quite a, quite a jag difference for, for preg rate. So we've got quite a bit of work to do to get them cows back to where they were for fertility. But the problem is, and this is one of our cows, you'll see she looks more like the 1957 model, doesn't she? Uh, and we... we uh, we flushed this cow as a heifer, and you see that her, her milk PTA is almost identical to Gold Barbara. It turned out perfect, and her DPR is a mirror image of Barbara. Again, she's nine years old, uh, and so, uh, uh, eight years old. And uh, when we, we pictured her, and two weeks later, we classified her. And uh, I wasn't there, thankfully, but... Uh, the classifier thought this Iowa State must be the worst school in the world because these dumb guys not only wasted money flushing her, but then they wasted money picturing her, but it's pretty clear she doesn't give enough milk to feed the cats, right? Look at her, how fat she is and that utter. 
Well, truth be told, you know, she's milking 85 pounds a day there. She actually peaked right about uh, 220 days in milk, which we see from a lot of these EPR cows. They're, very, they're a different cow. They're a different cow. And so he made her 76 points. Ouch. <laughs> uh, both of us, did I mention both of us were on the judging team together at Iowa State? <laughs> so again, uh, yeah, so we were a little humbled there for a little bit, but you know, the next year she calved in again, peaked at 100 pounds a day and grew a little bit and she got raised to 83 and the next year she grew a little more and lost a little more weight and she was 86. And last, this spring at eight years and two months, she made 90 points and pretty nice cow. She's uh, 170,000 pounds of milk. She's paid a lot of bills, paid a lot of bills. And again, a lot of my wretched breeders don't like her. You know, she obviously the classifier didn't like her. She carries too much condition. And, and my kids would, gotta, would say, we gotta stop body shaving these heifers. I mean, they need that condition to do what they gotta do. And we just gotta get over it. Because DPR is a huge, huge deal. This is a, 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 the American Deer Science Association meetings that are this, uh, earlier this week. And uh, we funded a study at the uh, university, uh, Cornell University and looking at the interaction between our products and genetic merit for reproduction. So what we did is we went across, uh, they went to six different herds, tested groups of two-year-olds come in the Springer pen, and we put them into high, medium, and low for reproductive performance, okay? Then we took and split those heifers, and we put half of them in a double off-sync program, okay? And we took the other half, and we put them in a simple loo lice at day 55, and we followed them for 21 days and saw what percent of them got bred. So we look at that group there on the right-hand side, the loo lace group. We can see that we, I'll tell you that about 70% of those heifers got bred. A lot of those herds had collars and things like really good heat detection uh, abilities. And so they bred about 70% of those heifers in that 21-day period. And we look at the conception rate, we see that we go from 39 to 54% between high, between low and high genetic differences. So really open some eyes for some reproductive physiologists that us geneticists can come out and do this little snip, Brian, and be able to tell who's going to get pregnant so much better than the other ones. So now this double love sync program, if many of you are familiar with that, uh, that really helped. That took those low genetic merit heifers and made them get pregnant. And the thing about this is 100% of them got bred, Lloyd, not 70%. 100% of them got bred at day 85. And you can see the conception rate's 60%. The 50%. The, uh, and then the high genetic merit, they're not as different. You put that intense protocol, again, Dr. Fricky and them here at the University of Madison, yeah, that is a fertility pro protocol they have developed. It really does improve the fertility of these animals. But as I travel the country, our producers are telling us, yeah, that's great, but it's too many shots. I just don't like giving that many shots. I don't have the labor. I don't like the look of it. We want that kind of fertility with very little intervention. And again, that's pretty unique. I mean, Paul Burr, who I really, have, really appreciate and have grown to, to admire working on the GAC, he said to me most succinctly, he said, you know, when I was younger, I thought I worked for the cows, and now I kind of think they got to do their part. They got to do their part. So again, these cows got to do their part. So this is a huge deal to our, to our end users in these commercial herds. Um, again, why am I talking about eight-year-old cows, nine-year-old cows here today? Uh, because we're at the point where we're looking back. You know, we tested these heifers uh, when we first launched our product and we've been following them. And you know, we promised these producers that we could predict lifetime performance. You know, life, take this SNP and not only pre prevent, you know, predict these little, these other, all these individual traits, but true lifetime performance. And as we look at this uh, graph, you know, this is a graph I run for most of the herds I go to. It's actual milk production by parity. And so uh, the, uh, you know, these two-year-olds are milking fantastic in this herd. They're at 87 pounds, but the mature cows, they're at 110. That's a lot of, lot of juice, right? At, you know, at Cornell, you know, Dr. Van Amberg, he says if we weigh those two-year-olds and we weigh those mature cows, that ratio of their weights is kind of going to be the ratio of the milk they give. So he 
proposes really, really, really pushing those heifers, getting them big and strong at 22 months of age, and they'll calve in, and he'll shrink that difference to 85%. But again, 15% more milk is still a lot of milk. And so we have more and more producers who are looking at this and, and saying, you know what, maybe I should be running a 40% cull rate, and I can crank that back down to 35%. I have producers now who are telling me we're going to 25% cull rate. Well, the problem with that is older cows have more health issues. There's no two ways about it. There's no two ways about it. Again, we talked, about, talked again and again about nobody likes treating cows. I was at a conference in Florida, and there was a veterinarian who managed some large herd, system of herds, and he told the audience, this is my favorite way of treating sick cows. And he put up a slide that showed a truck and a livestock trailer. He put them on the bus and get them out of there. He just didn't like treating cows. So again, that's the biggest hesitation we have with moving to an older herd of cows. So how can we optimize uh, heifer generation? This is a big thing where we're really talking about precision agriculture today and just really tightening up what we're doing on the dairy farm uh, and using this genomic tool is really useful for that. Again, so this would be a, a graph that we would typically run for a different herd. So again, everybody knows their heifers are their best genetics if they're doing a good job. And you can see here that the heifers in this herd average 300 net merit dollars. Or, and, but you'll also see uh, they're, you know, they're making $100, years a, $100 a year progress, approximately. That's tremendous. Uh, but the thing about it is they're using sex semen on all those heifers. And those tail end heifers are worse than their average mature cow. You know, do they really want to have their calf out of them? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, it's that amount of spread that we see people don't understand. Why we go in and test a group of 100 heifers, uh, we'll typically see, see the range of seven to $800 between the best ones and the worst ones. No matter what herd we go to, that's pretty much what we see. So there's tremendous overlap. Even though we're making progress, there's still tremendous overlap and room for improvement. So again, we, we talk to more producers that you don't need to make so many heifers if you're gonna run this lower cull rate. And so they're, they're getting rid of some of the low end heifers. That's a, a big change for a lot of people because those heifers look fantastic today. And uh, they're starting to use a lot more of this beef semen on the low end of the cows. Uh, and then uh, some, not all the heifers deserve sex semen. We're gonna tighten that up just a little bit. And we got more and more people are moving to a sexed beef model. Why are they going to a beef model? Uh, again, this is from uh, Iowa State University, a model of science with practice. Uh, this is the discount of a Holstein steer to a beef steer, the annual average. And you can see, in two, and so the way we read this, so the very bottom red line there, a four to 500 pound feeder steer going, being sold in the open market today. A Holstein traditionally ran a 30 to 40% discount compared to a, a beef breed steer, okay? And as they got closer, and, uh, the, as they got older, the discount is less because you have to put less feed in them to get them done. But then at the very end, when they go to harvest, they still have a tr uh, pretty significant discount because they don't yield out quite as well. And then that fell off in 2016. And why that happened? Well, Holstein steers are not beef steers. You know, they're not as efficient. You know, they takes more feed to put to get them done. It, they have less muscling. Uh, that's a big deal, and uh, they're less adaptable to their environment. So, yeah, there's a big push. Uh, people wonder if this beef will this beef uh, premium for these crossbred calves continue? Yeah, it's capitalism. These calves are truly better. You, you talk about 10% less feed. That's huge. That's a huge, huge deal when you're feeding a calf intensively for a year. Okay, and the other thing that I thought, Corey, we had busted, I thought Don Cole and, and Jana uh, Hutchinson at, at, uh, uh, at USDA had busted this myth that, uh, you know, that I still see some people that want to use beef semen on hard breeding cows. And I don't see anything in this paper or any of the data that I looked at that says that's a good deal. Now, if you want to use beef semen and you really don't care if she gets pregnant, I guess it makes sense. But if you really want to get her pregnant, you should use a high SCR Holstein bull. She, that would help her get pregnant. Uh, again, that's a, that's a myth that needs busting because I still run into it a fair amount. So I diverge. Angus bulls have lower, beef bulls have lower conception rates than Holsteins. Again, as we shift to the sex beef model, 
we're, we're going to need an even more fertile animal to execute that, that plan. Again, so see more and more people using uh, more and more beef. And, uh, 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 and like I said, we have more and more Holstein herds that are switching to a complete sexed beef. That's all they're using. They're trying not to make any Holstein bull calves. And they're still doing embryo transfer. They figured out these good ones are really, really good. And they don't have any aspirations of having a sale, cow and the heifer, heifer in the sale tonight. They just want to make their herds better. And so they figured out these, they can pencil this out pretty well. Too many traits? That's another, that's a constant thing I hear as I travel. You keep coming up with new traits. Why are we doing this? Uh, we're going to spread ourselves out too much. Again, this is a stillbirth graph. We had a real problem with Holsteins, uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago. We just lived with 11% dead calves from our two-year-old Holsteins. We just lived with it. And then we decided to get evaluations for it. And it's amazing how much we've changed that. I go to herds. This data is from 2014. I'll never be able to update this data. Never. I, I do not find these heifers that are 10, 11 anymore. Again, the way we read this is you, just like your bull books, you get these predictions back on your heifers. They might be 8.3 for daughter stillbirth. And so I look at those heifers. In, these, in this herd, uh, I took all the heifers between 8.0 and 8.9. I called them an 8. And I said, what percent of them had a dead calf? And again, there was 769 heifers in that group. And we had 85 of them had a dead calf, 11%. Because that's our breed average heifer right there. So it worked perfectly. And we look at the nines, 312 heifers, 40 dead calves, and so on. Six out of 14. I saw this again and again and again at herds. And people thought I was pretty amazing. But they were blaming their crew, calf crews and all these sort of things. Well, it was the bulls they had used three years prior. So again, but look at the numbers on, of heifers involved in the five, six, seven group here. Tremendous number, group of numbers of heifers there. As I go to herds today, almost all the heifers are under eight, under nine. You know, I, very, I see very few nines. And again, I see large, large groups of Holstein heifers having 2% dead, dead calves. Fantastic improvement. Did we put a lot of weight on that trait? No. But I'm sure the AI guys, CMX, probably, if they had a bull that was on the border and he was bad for stillbirth, that was the reason to get rid of him. And we made progress, absolutely made progress. We also learned that these traits are very nonlinear. So this is our mastitis prediction. Uh, we went to 11 herds across the United States and sampled uh, 300 heifers in each of those herds. And we've been following them for the last three years. And uh, uh, it's, the results have been pretty interesting. When we look at the heifers after the first year of the study, which are the blue bars there, published, and that data was published in the Journal of Dairy Science, we didn't see that much mastitis. You know, even in the worst group, 16% of the heifers had at least one case of mastitis. You might yawn at that. You say, well, you know, sure, you cut that in half when you went to the best 25%, but that's not a lot of tubes. You know, it's not a big deal. But look what happens when those heifers go to second lactation. As we all know, mastitis goes way up as we increase parity. And those heifers in the bottom 25% are pretty tough to live with at that point. And again, if we're going to talk about shifting the herd to an older herd, we really, really got to focus on this. Is, again, as Repro has improved so dramatically, this trait is becoming the number one reason cows are leaving the herd in the, in the herds who I work with. What about calf health? Mike was talking about our consumers. You know, we treat 20% of our calves in this industry. Is that, that's a little bit much. Now we've got genetic predictions for calf health. These are extremely well-managed herds here. They only, they're only treating about 11% of their heifers. But yet, when we look at the difference between the best 25% and the worst 25%, it's about half the heifers are getting treated. And this is a little bit biased data because surprisingly or not, people don't like testing dead heifers with us. I don't know why but they don't. I, I always send all my dead ones in, but I'm kind of an outlier that way. So again, talk about dead calves. This is the same, uh, same data set, looking at the percent dead up to a year of age. Again, the best 25% to the worst 25%, it's about half, half the death. Pretty big deal. Again, as we, to summarize this, I think 
Today, it's been fantastic. You know, the, the emphasis on genetics in the dairy industry is sky high. We have more, we have producers here tonight that are gonna buy at this sale that never would have dreamed they'd ever buy an animal at the National Convention sale, right? Never would dream. In fact, when I was putting this slide together, I said to my wife, she saw how hard I was working at and practicing, which is rare for me, and she says, what? She goes, man, you're really working on us. I said, yeah, this thing's a big deal. I said, this is Corey Geiger, he's kind of a high pressure guy. He's, he's pulled in like, he's hoping to pull in 1,200 people. There's gonna be people from all the country, all over the world. Some of the leading geneticists, legends, like Lloyd Holtzman, Don, right in front row. I said, it's a huge deal. I said, did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams that I would be speaking at such a conference? And she looked at me and she says, well, no, not really, but you're not really in my wildest dreams that much anymore. <laughs> But I, I digress. Just like the poultry uh, slide I showed, uh, you know, if you're a poultry producer, you better have a pretty good supplier of your birds, or you're not going to be you're not going to be competitive on your cost of gains. And I think producers today understand genetics is a pretty big lever that they got to get they got to get that right. They can't mess that up anymore. So it's a big deal. And, and again, genomic predictions, they're really, really useful for these lowly heritable traits. And, and, and we're just starting to understand this, and there's significant benefits to having a more fertile, healthy cows. I mean, Dr. Britt is gonna to talk tomorrow about uh, what we're starting to understand about epigenetics. And again, we show that real thin cow, it's pretty well conserved across all our species. When mom is starving, nature says, you don't need any more babies, in fact, your babies should be less fertile because your population's under some stress right now. So again, we're just starting to understand that as Dr. Lois gave us a C minus, which I thought he's a pretty tough grader. I thought he's a tough boss, but he's a real tough grader. But anyway, uh, again, we're starting to talk about precision use of females for replacements. And this is a big deal. I don't know if any of you noticed, but the milk price is a little off. I don't know if you, it's not quite the same as the 2014. This capturing this crossbred premium is a pretty big deal. I don't think now that producers are kind of getting a taste of that, I don't think they're going to give that up. And, and again, so we really, really need to work on our fertility and our health as much as anything. Thank you so much.